What an incredible worship team and choir. What an incredible job they did, yes. As they led us in worship, as they led us in worship to our God today, I feel like not only do I not want to follow them, but I can't follow them. That was amazing. And as one of the student pastors, after that giving talk by Miss Carol Kane and the giving video, yes, we would love to have you guys serving in our student ministry and the welcome team or as a life group leader. We need that. And I can just be done right there. How's that? Can I be done? No. Nah. Well, hey, guys, I'm Mark Smith, and I am one of the student ministers here at Dogwood Church. And so today we start a new sermon series called Ordinary People, Extraordinary God, or how how God, the hero of the Bible and the hero of human history, uses regular people to do huge things. So several of us Dogwood ministers are going to be speaking in the coming weeks this summer, And for the second year in a row, I get to lead off. So I'm pretty pumped to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm honored. Uh, How about we get into a little something today and have a little fun? Sound good? All right. First, let's pray. God in heaven, uh, I I am a man like the prophet Isaiah of unclean lips. God, you know that. And so my prayer is that you will take that hot coal and cleanse me so that these would be your words and that I would be more worthy to be here today. God, we pray that your words are heard and that those who need to encounter you in powerful ways, that's all of us, God, but that we would encounter you in the ways that we need most. We pray these things through your son. Amen. Well, some of you guys know me, some of you don't, but I, I grew up in this area. I'm just, a, I'm just a regular guy from Fayetteville. That's me, regular guy from Fable. I started at Flat Rock Middle School in the sixth grade. I was the first class, I was part of the first class to go all the way from the sixth grade in Flat Rock all the way to graduate Sandy Creek. All right, all right. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I noticed this growing up in, in this area. This is, a, this is a pretty well-off county, Fayette County, pretty well-to-do county, pretty wealthy My parents did fine, I guess. They were super frugal, though, but, I mean, we had things in the morning like Eggos and Cheerios and Pop-Tarts. I don't know why anybody would eat those things, but we did. And at night, we had roast beef. We had fried chicken. Can I get an amen? Anybody hungry already? I'm getting there. I'm getting us there. Well, we had food to eat. It was accessible. Unlike one in four Atlantans who live in food deserts across the city, food deserts, areas with limited access to fresh produce and meats. 2018, according to the USDA, one in four Atlantans live in food deserts. Basically, basically they, they can't really get to fresh food. So like, even if they had the money to buy it, and they really don't, um, the, the Publix and the Kroger, are just, they're just too far away. So whether by foot or by bike or by bus, it's just not feasible for them to get to these grocery stores. And so they take what little money they have and they buy really highly processed food at the corner convenience store. Look it up. Food deserts. It's a thing. Well, back to me, ordinary little old me. I I did have clothes on my back, thank goodness. They might not have always been cool. They were hand-me-downs, but whatever. I had clothes. I, I, I felt generally safe in this area. The only violence that I felt like I dealt with, that we dealt with on a regular basis, were things like mullets and tight roll blue jeans and jams and parachute pants. Those things were just wrong, and they need to stay in the 80s. They try to come back, but they need to, they need to stay. Have you noticed the roads in Fayette County? They're really nice. They're smooth, nice shoulders, pristine roads. I live in a neighboring county now, and it's just not the same. Growing up, we, we had clean water in my house. We actually had a well. We had well water. We had clean water. My neighbors had clean water. You guys probably have access to clean water today, unlike two billion, with a B, billion people in the world right now, according to the World Health Organization. And I had some great opportunities growing up and when I was older in college, like while I was a student in college, I studied abroad in Mexico City. I went there to, as part of kind of a campus ministry plant, and I just played, went to school, invited people. That's all I did. But I, I, and I had encountered before, I had encountered poverty in the world before, 
in places like Juarez, Mexico. But one time in Mexico City, while I was crossing a major intersection downtown, anybody ever been to Mexico City? I'm curious. So you know what I mean when I'm talking about crossing on foot the major intersections in Mexico City. Lanes don't really apply. Lights don't really apply. It's kind of a free-for-all, just kind of ants, just, you know. And so when you're crossing the intersection, you're just trying to survive, and then, and then maybe get to the other side too, but first trying to survive. And I'm crossing this intersection, I'm in the middle of it, and I'm just trying to get across, right? And all of a sudden I encounter this young boy who is younger than both of my sons today. He's probably, he was probably around eight. And as I'm getting closer, I'm trying to figure out what he's doing, and he is dressed, and only all he's wearing are some tattered blue jeans. They're up, they're up high, they're shredded. He's got no shoes on, he's got no shirt on. No hat on, nothing. He's really, really dirty. His hair is matted. His feet, are, his feet are filthy, and he's carrying a blanket. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. It's all happening in just a matter of seconds, you understand. And he walks up to me right in front of a car, and he drops the blanket on the ground. And I notice that the blanket is full of shards of broken glass. And to my absolute horror, he lowers himself down and lays himself on the broken glass. And I realize in that instant that what he's trying to do is pedal for money. Sort of like people around here might wash your windows for a couple of bucks. This was his way to make money. Guys, I was, I was shocked. It was all very quick. I, w- I was repulsed. And if I can confess to you as a college student, that day in the fall of 2000, when this happened, this visceral reaction sort of welled up within me. Nobody else heard it except me and God, but I cursed out loud. I mean, it just shocked me and I just, let one go. Not the worst word in the language, but it was a curse word. And to, to borrow from Tony Campolo, his illustration as a famous speaker, I want to ask us this. Does it bother you more this morning that one of your pastors is talking about cursing and how he cursed? Or does it bother us more? Does it bother you more that this boy was living in total destitute squalor? Today I ask myself still, why him and not me? Why him and not me? What did I do? Why, why the disparity? Why my wealth, my relative wealth versus his abject poverty? I don't really have an answer. Disparity, the, well the situation was similar in the northern kingdom of Israel in the eighth century BC. We're gonna dive into some history here. In the 8th century BC, in the northern kingdom of Israel, there was, there was peace, relatively. There was power. They had wealth. Some of them had wealth, and there was success. But there was this big problem, and the prophet Amos was sent to address this problem. There was great disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Amos, he was one of the earlier prophets, at least with a biblical book bearing his name. He was a minor prophet, and that just mostly means that his writings were pretty short. <laughs> He's a minor prophet. And in those days, the kingdom of Israel, remember like with David and Solomon, it had been divided. The United Kingdom had been divided. You had the northern kingdom called Israel, sometimes called Jacob when we read Amos, and the southern kingdom called Judah. And Amos was from the southern kingdom of Judah, just a little south of Bethlehem, this little town called Tekoa, probably kind of like Fayetteville. And in that day, King Uzziah was on the throne in Judah and Jeroboam II was on the throne in Israel. So that kind of places us in history. And Amos said, he was just a simple shepherd. And the scripture says, an addresser of sycamore trees. I had to look that up. What's a, what does a dresser of sycamore trees do? Does he prune? And it turns out that the sycamore was kind of the poor man's fig tree. Had a little fruit on it and he would poke holes in it so that it would ripen more quickly. That was his job, a shepherd and a dresser of sycamore trees. If Leonard Skinner had been around in the 8th century BC, they would have had Amos in mind when they wrote their song, Simple Man. Just an ordinary dude like me. He even says of himself in the book of Amos, I was no prophet, he said. I was no prophet. But the Lord called me. Mm. By the way, when we talk about prophets, a lot of times we think that they're talking about the future all the time, but 90% of what they did wasn't foretelling, it was actually forthtelling. 90% forthtelling, about 10% foretelling. What I mean by foretelling is that their primary job was to be the mouthpieces of God and to bring a, 
an honest, a, a biblical word of wisdom from God to a present situation. It's mostly what they did. And in short, in this situation, Amos came, if I can be honest with you this morning, Amos, this man of God, this ordinary man of God, came to the northern kingdom of Israel to, to kind of give him a tail whooping. I mean, it was, he brought it. He brought it, and we're going to read about it. So what was the problem? Well, the primary factor was that those at the top, they weren't just wealthy. They didn't just happen to be there. They were pushing down the poor and oppressing those at the bottom. They held them down. They turned a blind eye to the hopeless, to the hurting. There were bribes. There was exorbitant taxes. They skimmed off the top of transactions. They took advantage of people in court who didn't have representation, couldn't defend themselves, couldn't afford it. Meanwhile, they feasted. And for many of them, it was very intentional. For some of them, I'm sure it was just kind of oversight. But either way, it was decisive. And ultimately, it was a faith issue. They were not following God. And God sent Amos to call them out. So for example, in chapter 6, he's talking a little bit to Judah too, but mostly to Israel. He says this in chapter 6, starting with verse 4. He says, Woe to you, he says, because you lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions. But you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph, one of the more impoverished tribes. Chapters three, four, six, all over, talks about the violence the strongholds, the power mongering, the political maneuvering, the boasting, the arrogance, the pride, the sexual sin that accompanied this lifestyle. Some profaning the name of God, even, even taking wine as a payment from the peasants and indulging in it right there in the place of worship. Some of the things going on. In chapter four, one of the most salient images is when Amos compares the people to, to cows. In chapter four, verse one, he calls them the cows of Bashan. Cows apparently famous for their robustness. He's basically, he's like, guys, you're just lazing and grazing while other people are herding. And you're just asking for others like cows grazing on the pasture just to bring you you wine, bring you more to drink. The family structure, the tribal structure in the northern kingdom of Israel was was totally broken down. I'm I'm just gonna let that one sit on us this morning. What's more, the priest, Amaziah, Jeroboam's priest, basically when Amos is talking to him, says, just go, Amos. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk to you. Just go back to Judah. Go back to Tekoa. I don't want to hear the truth. Guys, when when we tune God out, when when I turn off the truth tellers, the soothsayers in my life who are speaking a word to me from God, and we're in trouble, are we not? When we just tune God out, So it's a really rich book. I encourage you, please read it. When you read it, you kind of see that Amos begins by talking about the nations around Israel first. It's interesting because it's it's almost as if it's it's a really cool literary device. It's almost as if you can hear Israel cheering him on. Like, that's right, get him, Amos. You got Edom, you got Moab. That's right, they're terrible, Amos. Even gets to Judah a little bit, the southern kingdom. And finally, he lands on Israel. Boom. It's like if you were to hire a comedian to roast everybody at your party. You know, you got this fun comedian, he's roasting everybody. But what you didn't know is that the comedian all the while was planning his final act to roast you. That's how it was. Ouch. In chapter four, God kind of begins, he's already speaking, but he kind of begins to speak. Guys, I wanna remind you who I am. I wanna remind you, and I wanna tell you what I'm gonna do about your sins. This is what he says in chapter four, verse two. Starting with verse two, the sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. I'm gonna explain that in a second. You will each go straight out through breaches in the wall. They're gonna, they're gonna bust down your walls. You're gonna be led straight out your symbols of security out of your city and you will be cast out toward Herman declares the Lord. And then in verse 12, therefore, this is what I will do to you, Israel. And because I will do this to you, Israel, prepare to meet your God. My own translation, are you ready to meet your maker? Yikes. Are you ready to meet 
your God. He who forms the mountains, who creates the wind, who reveals his thoughts to mankind, who turns dawn to darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord God Almighty is his name. Some translations, the Lord of hosts, or maybe literally the Lord of armies, this ancient warrior God who, by the way, has not lost a battle. You think I'm on your side? I'm coming for you. Whoa. This is what God says to them. And it's like he's saying, I can hear the armies coming, guys. And he's gonna use, he's gonna use a foreign people to do this. I can hear the armies coming. The land will shake whether by an actual earthquake or the marching army or both, I'm not really sure. They actually both happened, but the smoke and the arrows and the vast numbers of Assyrians, their drums, their marching, their horses, they, they rumbled the earth and they blotted out the sun. Basically, God says, I'm gonna allow the Assyrian army, the great empire of the time, to completely decimate and conquer you. That's what's gonna happen. Guys, the Assyrians were bad dudes. Most scholars would say that they were the baddest dudes in the Bible. They made the Babylonians look good. They would batter and burn everything, impale your leaders on stakes, flay you alive, put your skin on display, gouge out your eyes, cut off your limbs, pile up the heads. Or if they left you alive, they would march you away beaten, naked, and tied together like the scripture said with big hooks in your mouths as if you were a fish on a stringer. They kept you as one of the lesser important nobles. They would make you literally grind up the bones of your ancestors to symbolize the end of your line. Total subjugation. I would, I would compare these to a modern people group, but I can't find one that's this bad, and I don't wanna talk that bad about people groups. These guys were that rough. You may ask, why would God, you, why would God let these evil people triumph? Well, that's another discussion altogether. And let's just remember, Amos didn't come for the Assyrians. Their time's coming. Amos came for the northern kingdom of Israel. And let's don't finger point like they were prone to doing. He was sent to Israel. Suffice it to say, when you read through Amos, the Lord kind of scratches his head over all the times he gave them victory, all the times he gave them a leg up, every opportunity and every chance he gave them to repent. Yet they did not turn. Sound familiar? Therefore, justice will prevail. So I'm gonna read what I think is kind of the climax of the book, one of the most important parts of the book, Amos chapter five, verses 18 through 24. Before we read, I wanna introduce a biblical concept, concept to you so that you can look out for it as we read. And that is this Old Testament, this Hebrew Bible doctrine of the day of the Lord. There was this idea that the day of the Lord will come when all enemies will be vanquished, when the glory days of the kingdom, like of David and the United Kingdom, will return, and there will be security once again, our land will be back, our temple, all will be restored. So with that in mind, let's read Amos 5, 18 through 24. Here we go. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness? And this next part's tough as we sit here assembled. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never failing stream. For you, O Israel, the day of the Lord will not be renewal but reckoning. I don't know if it's hit you yet, but this is the point in the movie when your eyes bulge, your throat closes, your heart sinks, and your jaw, dro jaw drops. Not like watching Maverick when you're like, man, I can't believe those planes are doing that. But like for real life, this is like, what in the world? Listen, I mean, God says to these people, I'm not gonna save you like you think I am, and, and he didn't. Are we hearing that this morning? 
Guys, I'm telling you, the northern kingdom called Israel as a physical nation was never to be anymore. It would never rise again. It was utterly wiped off the earth, off the face of the earth forever. I don't know if you recognize that line from chapter five, verse 24, but it was aptly quoted by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he, walking the prophetic tradition, spoke during his famous I Have a Dream speech as he declared, we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Have you ever stood under a waterfall, even a small one? You felt the force of the water on your shoulders, on your neck, on your head. As a waterfall hammers down, so God's justice rolls. We serve a God of justice which means a God who puts things back to rights, a God who straightens inequities and puts things back the way they were intended to be at creation in Genesis, a God of justice. And I like that when it's not directed at me. I don't wanna talk about it when I'm at the butt end of it. And his justice, God left them to it. Israel had made its bed, he let them sleep in it. They set the stage, he let it play out. The chickens came home to roost, however you wanna say it. They had pushed God so far away, his hands out of their affairs that they no longer recognized him. And it was like, how am I supposed to help you when you've pushed me so far out? Have you ever done that? As a parent, teacher, coach, maybe just kind of let it play out. My son, Gabe, was just a toddler. We lived in a small condo. We were younger. And he was doing that thing where he was really, really obsessed with the electrical outlets, right? What toddlers do. And man, I'm, I don't, I'm about safety, and so we're doing everything to keep them away from those outlets. Putting little plugs in, they were kind of old and loose, and they would just fall right out. What are we gonna do? We kept trying, we kept trying. It was almost as if he not only was curious about the outlets, it was almost as if he was doing it just because we were telling him not to. You ever feel that way? And my mom was visiting, and she's really safety conscious. She's a really sweet lady, I promise. She's really wise. She goes, Leslie, Mark, you might just have to let him get shocked a few times before he learns. Mm. And you might be saying, I can't believe God left them to that destruction. I can't believe God did that. I can't believe God did that to his people. He didn't. Don't misunderstand what's going on here. They did it to themselves. God had had enough. Apparently, that's a thing. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, well, here's the thing. To to properly apply this to us, we have to look not at our nation, although we can do that too, but we have to look at the church. Because as it says in 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10, we are the chosen people, the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation, God's possession. My paraphrase, and once you're not a people, now we're a people. Once we're not receiving mercy, now we we receive mercy. We're, We're the church. We're God's people talking to the universal, worldwide, capital C church. And of course, for us, that starts right here at Dogwood. Ask the question, how, we, how can we fulfill our mission as a church if we don't show love to others? We can't. One thing's for sure, speaking on behalf of the younger generations, they don't want anything to do with an organization that comes across remotely fake, two-faced, self-interested, in this case, a, a church that might claim to be about love but turns a blind eye to fringe groups, a church that peddles righteousness but comes across as self-righteous and closed off to hurting and marginalized people. That's a surefire way for us as a universal church to lose our children today. I can promise you that. First John 3, 16 through 18 says, this is how we know what love is, paraphrasing again. Christ died for us and we ought to lay down our lives for brothers and sisters. If anybody has material possessions and they don't help a brother in need, how can they have love in them? Let's love with action and truth. I'll be the first to remind us all in this room that just a stone's throw from here right over there is this great, incredible place called the Real Life Center. It's a wonderful place through which this church reaches out a loving hand to people in our community who need a leg up and a boost and a feel the love of Jesus. It's a wonderful place. I can brag on it because I really have nothing to do with it. I don't mean that I don't support it. I don't mean I don't volunteer, but the heroes are the ones who built it, who make it go day in and day out. What a wonderful thing, the Real Life Center. More of this, that's justice. Yes, 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 yes. The warning of Amos, though, that resounds through the ages, however, 
is to not rest on our laurels. That's the very mistake they made in Israel, and the, and the most fatal one. They, they might have taken it to the next level, but it started with the resting, where they just thought they were, they had it. So let's keep going. Let's keep growing. If not through the RLC, through organizations like Compassion International, sponsoring kids or Habitat for Humanity, building homes, and we can go on and on. I was hiding out at a coffee shop the other day, hiding out at one of our local coffee shops. I'm not going to tell you which one because it's my hideout. Some of you see me, see me there. I was working on this sermon, just kind of wrestling with it, to be honest, and I ran into Kathy Berger and Reese. Kathy, our, our founder, or, or, or she's been around, not really our founder, I guess, but been around since forever, forever, forever of the Real Life Center. And um, I mentioned Amos to her. Of course, she's, she's not with the Real Life Center anymore. But I mentioned Amos to her, and I was so glad to run into her. And she was really, really quick. She was really quick to remind me of how poverty is so much bigger than economic poverty, just economic poverty. We talked about a few things and kind of came out with this, with this list as I kept thinking about it. There's, there's emotional poverty, isn't there? Despair and brokenness. There's psychological pro- poverty. There's mental illness. There's social poverty. There's loneliness and just being on the outside. There's physical poverty, Sickness and handicap and things that come with age. There's spiritual poverty, lack of purpose, so much spiritual poverty, lack of truth, lack of peace, lack of hope, no faith. And Kathy emphasized a lifestyle in investing in others. This is what she said. She was like, Mark, we just, whatever, whatever their needs are, whatever people's needs are, we just have to invest personally and, and live a lifestyle of loving and being there for others. And then we will learn what their needs are. And then we'll be able to serve them and love them. Bottom line, if we jump to Philippians 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. That's how we do this. That's how we bring about justice. We look to the interests of others. Whatever the poverty, let's get to it. We can do it here at Dogwood. We can help out with those grieving or divorce care or with the homebound or with the sick. We can teach the next generation. I've already talked about that. I'll be out of the table after this. I literally will be. We can talk about that. We've got VBS coming up. We can, we can go to dogwood.church slash volunteer and there's all these myriad of ways we can plug in through Dogwood to help others. Please do that, I pray. There's also a broader application here beyond just helping others. There's a, there's a bigger point. It was, it was sin that God was after through the prophet Amos, and their sin just happened to be primarily oppressing the poor. What about our sins? We've all got a sin problem, don't we? What would Amos say if he was standing right here? What would he say to me today? What if God left it up to me to, to fix those things? I would be a self-made mess. I would be so utterly without defense. But he didn't leave it up to just me, and he, and he didn't leave me without defense. Because there's one thing that makes our situation today different than the situation in the 8th century B.C. in Amos. There's a big difference. There's, there's the pivot point in human history. There's one thing that makes it all different for us this morning, and his name is Jesus. You see, God did fulfill his promises to restore those people. He did not leave them to ruin. I want to read from Amos chapter 9, the very, very end. You have to wait till the very end of the book. Chapter 9, verses 11 through 15. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. There will be so much produce. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord, your God. Jesus accomplished all of this 
spiritually and eternally where it really matters for them and for us. Do we hear that today? The day of the Lord, do you remember that? The day of the Lord has come. Christ has come. And our lives can be rebuilt no matter what broken pieces lie around. And, and we've tasted it. We, we know of it, this day of the Lord. So how much more having experienced the, the risen Lord, how much more should we reach out as we started today to the marginalized? as much as we possibly can. At the end of the day, I think as we've kind of learned, justice is a lot more up to us than we ever realized. How much more should we model and talk about grace now that we have experienced grace? Who needs grace in your world? I mean, you do, I do, but to whom should we show grace? In the words of professor and author Christopher Yuan, grace is not just pardon, but power. Man, how the power of grace could change the world. That the day of the Lord has come also means that we need prophets in our lives. James 5, 16, you've heard it. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous and the King James availeth much. We need, we need Amos's in our lives. I need that in my life, mature, trustworthy brothers and sisters. How much more next, how much more must we confess, must, must we give our sins, confess and give our sins over to Jesus? How much more must we, must we repent? The word repent kind of reminds me of uh, in the Nerf Wars with my, with my boys you know, shooting little rubber darts at me. There's some rubber, rubber darts that have little plastic tips on them, and those suckers hurt. Especially my boys have these big, like, things like this, you know, and they're shooting me, the, like, and you're running at those things, and they're hitting you in the face and in the chest. What do you do? You turn around and run the other way because they hurt. God's repentance is like, why would we go this way when it leads to destruction and pain? Repentance is to turn around. And in the words of the great theologians and philosophers, Sister Hazel, if you want to be somebody else, change your mind, which is another good understanding of the word repentance, to change your mind, turn around and change your mind. By the way, no matter how bad it gets, and it, and it does get bad, doesn't it, with our sin, God has not left us to death and destruction after all. Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's follow Jesus because, he's, because of what he's done for us. Let's give up living for ourselves. So the good news, that's it. That's the good news. That's the gospel message. That, that's it for today. Like, the day of the Lord has come and you can have renewal no matter what we've done as long as we repent first and second as long as we place our faith in Jesus, our faith. John 3, 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. He that rejects the Son will not see life. God's wrath remains on them. But who believes will have eternal life. To believe, to place your faith in something. When you drove here this morning, you had faith that your car would crank. For some reason, you had faith that the people on the road would follow the laws. <laughs> sometimes they don't, but we gotta have faith sometimes. We had faith that when you came today that something great would be happening up here and then we would have church that somebody would be speaking, saying something. Hopefully, that makes some kind of sense. We have faith. We do it every day. So why not put your trust in Jesus, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, the full life, the abundant life, the real, rich, pure life here and forever. So let's let the words of Amos ring through the pages of history into our hearts today to yours and to mine, to respond, to repent, and to believe. Do you want things to be set right in your life? I know I do. And let's remember that the ultimate, the final day of the Lord has yet to come. When Jesus comes back and things really get put right, ultimate justice, let's remember that he might do this at any time. Like what if he came right now? What, what, what about now? What about right now? Are, are we ready? Are we ready for justice to be dealt? Which side are we gonna be on? Everything hinges on this. This is our lives. This is your life right now and eternity we're talking about. Everything is at stake. So do not delay. Whether it's to come back to Jesus or to come to Jesus for the first time, do not delay. If, you've, if you're ready today, if you've thought about this, you made a decision for the first time, I wanna invite you. I wanna invite you all to pray with me. I wanna invite you, especially you folks, who made a decision for the first time to pray with me right now. And these are not magical words. 
Um, there's just a guide. But if you will, if you all bow your heads, if you will pray with me right now. Father, I confess that I have done my own thing. I've lived life for myself. I confess that I've sinned against you and against others. And God, I'm so sorry. I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to totally turn around and follow you. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me, for uh, taking my sin upon you. Thank you, God, for conquering death, for rising from the grave so that I could live forever with you. God, thank you for loving me so much to do that. Thank you for loving me right now. I want you in my life as my Lord and as my Savior. Please live in my heart. Come into my life. Wash me that I may be a new creation. Please take charge. Please take charge of my life and direct me. I want to serve you with all that I am. Amen. So one more thing, guys. If that was you, or if you've made that decision before, it's important that you, that we profess our faith publicly. Like the Ethiopian official in Acts chapter eight who said to Philip the apostle, I don't know about this Jesus God, tell me about him. And then Philip told him about him and he said, okay, I get it, I believe. There's water over there. Why would I not be baptized? What a great question. Why would I not be baptized to tell the world? Matthew 10, 32 says, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. Guys, right here outside this door, we have, we have water, we have a baptistry. If you go through the lobby, out the doors, all the way outside to the right, we have everything you need. Towels, clothes, dressing rooms, people to help you, a team of really great people to help you. If that's you, either today or sometime very soon, we'd love to help you do that. And guys, all of us really have a next step, don't we? Either to move a little bit closer to Jesus or way closer to Jesus because we've been away and we need to repent and come back. Everybody has a next step. And so what I want you to do is there's a little connect card in the seat in front of you, in the seat pocket in front of you. It has some options on there. And if you're not here physically, you can text the word next to 770-285-1792. Either way, there's a little box you can check. And we want you to do this so that we can walk with you and celebrate with you. There's a little box you can check that says, I've decided to follow Jesus for the first time. There's a box you can check that says, I wanna be baptized. Um, because maybe, maybe you wanna wait. Maybe you don't wanna do it today. Maybe you want your family to come. There's a box you can check that says, I'm, com I'm coming back to Jesus today. I'm, I'm recommitting my life. Guys, I also want you to know that if you have questions about anything we've said today, or if you want somebody to pray with you, or just to talk to somebody or to a pastor, there is a connections canopy, a next steps canopy right outside these doors, all the way outside to the left. There'll be a great team of people waiting to talk to you there. Or if you're online, you can check that appropriate box and we will follow up with you. So guys, it's been my joy and honor to have been with you today. And I pray that what we heard today was the word of the Lord. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, God, for, even though it hurts sometimes, thank you for the truth and the power that's in your word that we need in our lives. God, most of all, we thank you today for the power of the resurrection and that the day of the Lord has come and that there will come a day when we will all be with you in spirit and in truth with all things put back together forever and ever. We praise you for that. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.